Well now, one of the themes that seems to come up as a crucial aspect of Hicks' thinking is this idea of life after death. Uh, we've already seen that with the idea of the verification of religious language, for example, he talked about an eschatological verification, I, that theism or belief in God or religious language uh, is made sense of by our experiences after death. Similarly, with the soul-making theodicy, of course, the, one of the criticisms that we didn't mention was that rarely are the soul -making, is the soul-making process accomplished in this single life. Because the question about the destruction that evil can wrought upon an individual's life leading to death, of course, is very a cogent criticism of the soul-making theodicy. So clearly, for soul-making to make sense, there has to be a continuation after we die, either the process carries on. So Hick is committed, therefore, to extending uh, the, the, the life's journey beyond death. This is not the only life that we actually lead. And so in the 70s in particular, in the early 70s, Hick was committed to the idea of studying this whole question about how do we make sense of immortality? Is the whole concept of life after death coherent? Because of course the real risk here then is that if we can't think of a coherent way to conceive of life after death, then a lot of Hick's projects really are, well, they're just academic exercises without any real uh, reference point. And so Hick is committed to the idea of there being some kind of existence beyond death. And his next great work after Evil and the God of Love, Death and Eternal Life, which was published in 1976, is devoted towards conceptions of life after death. And it's one of those, another one of those very comprehensive works that Hick has produced, where he covers uh, a whole range of beliefs uh, ranging from the early church, other religions, various philosophers, uh, the evidence, for example, of parapsychology is an important aspect of his study of life after death too. And drawing all these elements together, Hick is concerned to present a picture of how the journey continues beyond death. He's not just concerned with showing that we can, in principle, live after death, although he does deal with that earlier on in that particular text. So what, is, what position does Hick take? Well, he is a dualist, that is to say, he is committed to the idea that there is a, a distinction to be made between mind or soul and body. He thinks that therefore that studies in the brain or studies um, of the human person don't necessarily rule out the idea of there being something which is apart from the body, which is part which may be called a soul or whatever. But one of his real, most important, most famous contributions is to deal with this question about, well, what would re-embodiment look like? So he might say that, well, the, the self might persist in some kind of form after death, but in the end, he wants to say, well, in order for the life's journey to continue, in order for the soul-making process to carry on, there has to be a form of re-embodiment in another world, which is also the kind of world that has the challenges in the same way as this one, but it'd be a different kind of world. And so Hick comes up with a postulate about what that re-embodiment would be, and he calls it, very famously, a replica theory, or what he calls an exact replica. Now, what is this a response to? Well, it's a, he interprets it as being a modern view of traditional views of resurrection. Now, the early church fathers, if you read that they were concerned with finding very precise mechanical descriptions of how you might resurrect a particular person. And they were very concerned about getting the same particles together again. Uh, so, so, you know, when David Cheatham dies, are we going to be able to get all these particles together again? And so we'll have the real David Cheatham when the resurrection takes place. And what happens if, you know, he gets eaten by cannibals? Do they get some of his particles? And, you know, there's a big confusion that might break out. Um, and Hicks' observation that all these kinds of discussions are, of course, not really uh, representative of where modern science is in terms of quantum physics and what have you. Anyway, setting all that aside, what he thinks is, well, what is a modern conception? And he gives a, a thought experiment. He says, well, imagine as if I was giving a lecture in one part of the world, and then suddenly I reappeared in New York City, just carried on talking as if I, nothing had happened. I disappeared from one place and reappeared in the next. Exactly the same body, with eyes, coloration, stomach contents, everything. He said, would we have a problem in saying that the same person that had disappeared from one place 
had reappeared in another place. And the way I think of that, and this is obviously what uh, Hick has said, but if you think of, the, uh, of contemporary science fiction, uh, take a, a classic science fiction film like Star Trek, um, when uh, Captain of the Starship Enterprise says, beam me up, Scotty. And so he disappears from the planet and he reappears in the starship. And the point I think Hick is making, this is the way I interpret it, is that we don't look at that and say, well, hang on, is that the same Captain Kirk? Uh, how can we be certain it's the same body? And of course, we don't go through that process. We just take it as read that that's a rather obvious thing. He's been, his particles have been broken down and the same pattern has been reassembled in this other place, so we have the same person. So, and I remember asking uh, John actually about this. I said, is, do you actually believe <laughs> Um, that this is what is actually going to happen. We're going to have, have, we're going to have, to have, we're going to have replicas. <clears throat> I got the impression in talking to him that he saw it as more as a, a philosophical modelling, that he said, well, how might we defend the notion of re-embodiment? How might we, might we describe it as something that's meaningful? So I think it's, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm rather ambiguous about whether I could say that Hick actually believes that there will be replicas, but rather what he is, he's, be, he's behaving as a philosopher, He's constructing a particular model for how life after death might look and how re-embodiment might look. Now, of course, that, there's a, what would be a classic criticism about that? Well, when the early church fathers were bothered about searching through the you know, matter to find the real David Cheatham, there was a, there's a point there, and that is that David Cheatham is unique, that he's not, you can't copy him. To, in order to get the real person back, you have to somehow get that particular thing back. And so one of the problems with replicas is the, is the problem of multiple replication, because if in principle God can just sort of remake me uh, out of the, the Cheetham pattern, can be remade somewhere else, then can't he make two or three of me? And then doesn't the whole question of uniqueness break down? Does it mean that I, I can't say that I really continue after death if in principle you can divide me up into several parts? Because then I would ask the question, which one is the real me? And you wouldn't be able to give a clear answer to that. So there's some kind of intuition in the old view that somehow maybe you have to have uniqueness going on. So to, to the, one of the questions that have been asked in the journals in discussing Hicks replica theory when it came out was what about this question of multiple replication? Has Hick preserved uniqueness in his modern perspectives uh, on resurrection? But setting that aside, the whole point that Hick wants to paint, and this is another very famous thing that Hick is associated with, and this is the idea of many lives in many worlds. So Hick is already being pluralistic in the way he constructs his view of life after death. So he's bringing together Eastern ideas of reincarnation. And of course, Eastern ideas says that we might be reincarnated many, many times in many places and re reborn. Hick is, in a way, bringing together Western and Eastern traditions in his idea of many lives and many worlds. He says, and he's, of course, connecting that with his soul-making or irony and intuition, that there has to be an extension of time. And so this might, as far as he says, sees it, be a series of embodiments, a series of bounded existences where our souls are made further as, as we go on. He calls this, this period of time, by the way, par eschatology. That's a kind of an in-between. In so it's not a description of the final state. This is not Hick's view that the final state is a kind of a constant progression. He remains, uh, he, he reserves judgment about what the ultimate outcome would actually be of the soul-making process. So he describes this kind of um, postulate about what will happen after death as a kind of a par eschatology which is best summed up as a kind of many lives in many worlds where our souls continue uh, to be made and developed. Well, probably what John Hick is most famous for, um, well, when you say he's most, he's most famous for, of course, the truth is he's made contributions to such a broad range of things, but probably most controversially maybe, is his theory of religious pluralism and his pluralistic hypothesis. And this, was, this, this finds its, its greatest articulation in his, what I think is his magnum opus, which is called An Interpretation of Religion, which was published in 1989 and recently, uh, I think in 2004, went into a second edition. 
And it's here really that Hick creates his overall perspective or interpretation of religion. And you really get a sense in reading that book that it really is the sum total of a, a great deal of very deep and profound scholarship that he's undertaken over the many years. And certainly it brings together a lot of his thinking. In particular, what re seems to resurface very strongly is his very early work on epistemology, which seems to be the, the thread really that's gone throughout uh, Hick's thinking right from the very word go.